Hello world, welcome back. Uh, I'm Christina and I'm here with Louis Rothenberg, who's a local 600 DIT. Uh, and I'm really excited to chat with you. I haven't worked with you on a set in a while. And um, it, has been, it has been a while. Hi, Christina. Happy to be here. Um, I was wondering if you could tell all the fellas back home uh, how you started in this industry, maybe what your first job was on set or just in general. Wow. Um, I had a really kind of convoluted way into this industry way back in 1978, 79. I was, had no interest whatsoever in film and television. I was actually a theater arts major and was interested in working in theater as a, as a lighting designer. Um, and when I actually left school because my first year acting instructor offered me a job as her production stage manager for her theater company, which is in Brooklyn over on Bergen Street. She had a little theater company there and I was working doing that. And then I got a job at Amos Repertoire, which was Rosetta Lenoir's theater up in uh, 104th Street. I was the master electrician there making $75 a week and I was the highest paid person there. Um, and while I was doing that, an old childhood friend of mine who'd been in the video world since the 70s, like in the black and white video days and stuff, he got a job as the technical director at the Asia Society in Manhattan. And he was running the place, but they had a huge theater and he didn't know anything about theater. So I got brought in there as the resident lighting designer. And I was designing lights for all kinds of shows that came in. But my friend owned a... Um, you know, a small video company. And he was like, oh, why don't you come work in video? I'm like, no, I have no interest in this whatsoever. You know, I want to be in the theater. He goes, well, just come do it, make money. I said, okay. So I learned technical video. And I worked as basically like as a tape operator, video engineer. And I was, you know, we were doing a lot of, you know, corporate, you know, high-end corporate things. And back in the early 80s, video lighting was horrible. It was, you know, two big soft lights and that's it. And, you know, and that's kind of what things, you know, flat and horrible. And I would just sit there, you know, my usual snarky self making nasty comments about it. And one day someone finally said, well, he's a theatrical lighting guy. Why don't we let him light it? And I started lighting for video. And this is, you know, like 1980, 81. I had already gotten into the union, into Navid 15 as a video engineer, um, doing video playback, special effects video playback things. But then I was also working, you know, on all these kind of underground music videos, um, like well before it was popular to admit you did music videos when they were like you know, one step above pornography. And, uh, and I just kind of, so I started working as a lighting director because that for me was tolerable because I could light the stuff and never have to really watch it and leave. And I had for many years, I worked with a close friend who was a camera operator and we had a great relationship because I would light, he would shoot and everything worked well. And he knew my lighting style and he shot that way. He was an incredibly talented artist and he got into graphic arts in the early 80s and he stopped shooting and I worked with other camera people and I'm a very stingy lighter I like this so if you shot this it's not lit right and it really was getting to me so I just said screw this I'm gonna start shooting myself and I started operating and working as a you know as a you know DP and director cameraman and you know, was, had a, you know, pretty successful business as a, you know, as a director cameraman shooting a lot of, you know, high, you know, high end commercials, a lot of, you know, high end corporate stuff, live events. Um, but all along, I always had a technical background in, in, in 2000 and in, in 2000, when the whole first 24 P thing was coming out with Sony came out with the F 900, I was um, producing and directing a, a TV series for PBS called Jewish Cooking in America and Barbecue University. And uh, I went to my friend's rental house, Lyman Video Rental, and they told me about you know, this whole new camera, the F900, and they had just landed the first major television show that was gonna be shot electronically. It was called The Education of Max Bickford. And I just said to them, I said, well, who's engineering it? 
And they said, oh, they think they're looking for someone. I said, really? I said, I might be interested, which people were shocked because I mean, literally at that point, I had not worked for someone else in over, gosh, you know, in over like 11 years, you know, had I worked for someone else. I was always, you know, producing my own things. And I went and met with Michael Mayers, the DP, and it turns out that we both kind of lived in concentric circles of losing jobs to the same name DPs. And we laughed about that. And I said, yeah, look, I'll do this. And uh, thus I became one of the first DITs in Local 600. Me, Barry Minerly, and Abby Levine were the first three East Coast DITs. And I did it for a year. I hated it. I hated episodic television. It was like, to me, the worst. And this was a great show. This was Richard Dreyfuss, Marsha Gay Harden, Eli Wallach. I mean, like just a stellar cast. Yeah. I mean, you could have a better, I mean, Academy Award winning performers doing TV for the first time. But I just didn't like the whole, you know, vibe of it. And I said, I would never do it again. And I went back to my cushy PBS um, shows that I shot and my edit facility, which I had built, you know, years before that, you know, would edit and that had been my life. And that I did for a few more years. And I got into a falling out with my executive producer in 06 and said, that's it, I'm done with this. And I let people know I was available to DIT. And since 2006, I've been blessed to work 2000 hours a year as a DIT on feature films, episodic TV, some live event stuff. And that's kind of the, the whole story in a, in a nutshell. There are, some ancil- there are some ancillary stories that, you know, if, uh, you know, if I get drunk, I can tell you, but sober, I don't tell those stories. <laughs> that's fair. Yeah, I believe we, we worked on a pilot together, and that's how maybe we, were, we first worked together, but maybe through the union we had. Yeah, we, did we work on, was that Get Christy Love? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that, that was fun. That was actually, that was with uh, Gonzalo? Was yeah. That, I tell you, that guy, I mean, I, I've been very fortunate. I've worked with some very good DPs. He's the whole package. He's brilliant. His work is incredible. And he just couldn't work for a nicer guy. I, you know, I've reached out to him numerous times trying, trying to get work again, you know, but um, yeah, that was, that was actually fun. I didn't think the show would get picked up, which it didn't, but it was a fun job. Yeah. I'm actually going to um, speak with him later this week. Um, oh, send my, send my regards. We, uh, we, we've, we've, you know, Facebook chatted back and forth a few times and exchanged emails and texts over the years. Well, that actually leads to a good segue. I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate more on your partnership as a DIT with cinematographers, especially with your experience yeah. playing both roles. Yeah. yeah um, because of the fact that when I actually became a, a DIT, I already had 25 years experience in this industry. I'd worked as a DP, as a director cameraman. I, you know, had credits for, you know, indie feature films, for commercial, a lot of things. And over the years, hired a lot of the people that I worked, you know, ended up working with as, you know, DIT. I was very lucky. I, the DPs that I worked with recognized that my talent wasn't just technical, that I had, you know, aesthetic sense, that I I knew their job and was really, really there to watch their back. Um, I pride myself in getting into my cinematographer's heads and on projects, you know, I don't look at a scene and say, how would I like that? I look at the scene and say, what do I think you know, so-and-so is going to do, and let me try and get that color exactly where, so when they come back to the tent and look at things, it's like, yeah, that's it, and now we're just going to make some final tweaks. Um, And I've been very fortunate to have really good relationships with all the DPs I work with. Now, part of that is also, I've been at, you know, when I started doing this, I was at a part in my a point in my career where I could be a little more selective about what jobs I did or didn't take. So I don't really take jobs for DPs whose work I don't like. Um, I had one interesting situation with a DP who I hadn't worked with 
and he was he had generally worked with a friend of mine and that and he that friend wasn't available and they recommended me and I really didn't like his lighting you know I, it just wasn't my style you know I'm I'm a very dark person so I'm like very into things being underlit uh, you know I would never tell a DP something's too dark you know I'm like always pushing the envelope and he kind of for lack of a better word, overlit a lot of things. So it was hard for me at first because he would come back and want my opinion and my opinion wouldn't have been nice because I didn't like, I didn't like what he was doing. I mean, yeah. it was fine. It was technically everything was good. So that was like really weird. But it's funny because I became really close friends with him. You know, I really love him as a human being. He's like a really great person. And the next time we worked, I felt a little more comfortable in saying, hey, you think maybe, you know, want to take a look at a little less fill here? You know, we can handle that. It's got the range. And, you know, we try and like not impose my style on it, but just make suggestions in a way that you don't make until you get comfortable with a person. Yeah. So like I said, so for me, the DIT position has always been a very collaborative position with the DP. But as I tell all other DPs, I have this thing if I see something that I think is, for lack of a better word, wrong, or that I think should be brought up to the DP, I bring it up. If they don't want to do anything about it, that's fine. Unless I really think it's bad, and then I do this thing, it's like this, I go like, I go like this, and like this, and they say, what are you doing? So I'm just thinking about the size of my credit and the size of your credit. And that always gets them to look at what I want. Them to look at. <laughs> That's a great <laughs> That's my move. trade secret. That's my <laughs> trade secret. Wow. Um, People are going to know now. And, and there's a couple of DPs who I'm really, really close with. And I'll just be sitting in the tent doing my little finger thing. They'll, and they'll just turn around and go, F you. Just get, do whatever you want. Uh, but those are DPs that I'm very close with who, you know, I feel comfortable saying, really? You're going to do that? Um, but like I said, I, I feel very strongly that the DIT position is a support position. It is a collaboration, but at the end of the day, it's the DP's vision. And it's the DP's vision that he's trying to make for the director's vision. And I'm there to just facilitate it. Yeah, I'll make suggestions if I'm asked. You know, I'll you know, point things out that I think should be pointed out, but I don't try and impose my you know, aesthetics on projects. Would you say, is there a certain cinematographer or certain movies even that uh, you can always go back to to be inspired by? Or are you always looking like, wow, this person was great to work with. I love their work. You mean as far as who I want to work with or? Um, even or, just in general. The, I don't know. Is, is there a line for you of uh, cinematographers that you really admire their work, but you don't want oh. to work with? <laughs> or, um. Well, I mean, look, there are a couple of people whose work I think is great and I've heard are not the nicest people, but you know, some of those people I ended up working with and I had no problem getting along with. Um, I, you know, for me, uh, you know, like I said, there are a couple of DPs who I've developed very, very, very close, you know, working and friendship relationships with. And I love working with those people because we just have a great time together. You know, we just, you know, like to be in one another's company. Um, there are other DPs who I, you know, there's a whole bunch of DPs I'd love to get the chance to work with. Like I said, I would love to work with Gonzalo Amad again. He was amazing. Um, there's Avanya Trinul, who I've never gotten to work with. I really like his work and I've spoken to him numerous times. You know, if Matt is, you know, or, you know, or his regular guy isn't available, please consider me. Um, you know, there are some greats. I mean, you know, John Toll, who I've known for a long time through my union activities, I've never had the opportunity to work with, and I would love to work with him. Um, you know, this, you know, like, well, I recently, you know, got to work with um, uh, uh, Seamus McGarvey. I covered for Abby Levine on uh, The Greatest Showman, and, and I was just blown away by his work. And also another guy who's just a great guy. And it's like, and look, I, I, you know, I get how much pressure a DP's under. And that's why some of them are, you know, less than nice to all of us at times because they are under so much pressure. But the great ones, they, they just know how to deal with it. And it's just such a, such a pleasure to be with. And then I also, you know, it's funny because of, you know, my age, my experience, my stature in the industry, there are some people, you know, who are intimidated to hire me. You know, there are some DPs, you know, who, 
and I've worked with some of them and they, once they see that all I am is supportive and want to help them and want to make them better. I've developed some, you know, you know, relationships with, you know, DPs who are significantly less experienced than me that I've had a great relationship with. That's awesome. Would you say mm -hmm. your process to prepare for a job can be really different for a DP that's maybe younger or a different part in their career versus a DP that you've worked with or is older? Um, like I say, my jobs that, that I've worked with the DP before, it's always just, you know, boom, you know, phone call. Okay. What are you looking to do here? How do you want to do this? You know, you want to do this, you know, you know, just use go through my usual checklist of stuff. New DPs. I, I, as you know, I'm, I'm a pretty aggressive person. You know, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a passive person. I'm a pretty aggressive person and I come on pretty strong with new relationships. I try to temper how aggressive I am, you know, because I don't want to like scare people. I don't want to, you know, so I, you know, it's like say with, you know, this, I guess, you know, there has not been that many new DPs, you know, DPs that I've never worked with before. Um, you know, most of my work is repeat work or DPs that I've known for years and we finally get a chance to work with. So like my prep for a DP, it's really just trying to find out what it is they're looking for. You know, how much onset code do they want to do? You know, you know, how do they want to work? If they want to work in the tent with me or they want to just give me an idea, come back, check things, and they're going to work with the director, you know, find those things out. And it's the same way I do with all crew members. I mean, you know, I think it's very important for DITs to understand that you are part of the camera department and you only are part of the camera department if you make yourself part of the camera department. You know, if I get hired on a job and it happens to be an AC I don't know, I call them immediately and, you know, try and start up a conversation. Hey, you know, this is what I normally take care of. I don't like to get into your way. You know, you take care of that. You know, I don't, I mean, there was a point where I would always push for my loader because I had, you know, you know, I, there were a number of loaders that I was trying to train and bring up. But I reached the point where I recognized most loaders now, they're not really interested in becoming DITs. They want to move up the camera department ladder. They have as much interaction with the camera department as they do. So I always tell, look, I'm fine with whoever you want. You know, if you've got people, you know, I said, I have to be not, I'm fine with whoever you want to hire. You know, I can work with anyone at this point in my life. Um, but I think it's important just to have communication. You know, people lose sight of the fact that this is a communications industry. You know, so you just got to talk to one another. I know a lot of D DITs and a lot of first ACs who, you know, they, they lock horns about, you know, who's in charge. Like, I don't, I know what I'm in charge of. You know, I know what I do. I know what I've done my whole life. I'm more than happy. I, there's nothing, nothing makes me happier than to work with a strong first AC who runs a department and all I need to say, and I just say, look, just give me the consideration of letting me know when we've got additional days, you know, additional cameras. So I know things if there's anything I need, I can get you. And conversely, I sit in a position where I'm with the DP. A lot of times I'm with the director, a lot of times the producers, I hear things that the ACs don't hear. And I always tell them, hey, I just heard word that there might be another unit next week. I'm not trying to micromanage their life. I'm just trying to help them be part of the team. Are there certain projects, and this made me think of teams here, are there certain individuals or projects that you've worked on for the longest amount of time? I, I did a, like almost a five-year stint of working with Joe Collins and his gang. Uh, we did three Three or four years, three or four years of Royal Pains, three years of Nurse Jackie, um, and then the show Deception, and that was like the longest. Actually, Royal Pains was the first show that I ever did a second season of because wow. I kind of have a short attention span. I don't really want to go back to things, you know. If I've done it, it's like. But we had a, we had a great group of people, you know. Joe Joe and I had a great relationship. He's one of the few people who are more snide and snarky than me and quicker than me and with witty remarks. Not many we would have people like battles. like that. Yeah, we would have little battles to see who could get the witty remark out first. <laughs> and we laughed a lot. You know, I mean, I have, you know, incredibly fond memories of the five years working with him. And that was a long time, but it does just like anything else. It pulls you out of other things because there were, you know, it was a point when I had just finished doing a lot of other big things with people 
And I had this regular thing with Joe and knew that we were doing, you know, six months of Royal Pains and then three months of Nurse Jackie and then back to Royal Pains. And, you know, it was like, well, this is a good thing. You know, I've got money coming in. I know when I can take off. So there were a lot of DPs that I said no to that I wasn't available. And that, you know, that comes back to haunt you when all of a sudden people think that, like people, I would not get phone calls for jobs because people just assumed I wasn't available. It's like, don't assume I'm not available and I might jump off this job for yours, which I wouldn't because I don't believe in jumping off jobs, but you know, I might make arrangements, you know? So uh, yeah, that, but that's the longest. And then of course, um, Frank Prinzi um, is a dear, dear, dear friend of mine and probably, you know, the closest collaboration I have is with him. And we worked together for a few years and then we went, I think we went almost over close to seven years without working together. And then we recently, you know, reconnected and did a couple of projects last year. And I'm hoping when all this is over that, you know, cause he's one of my favorite people to work with just because of the friendship that we have. Um, and then over the years, you know, I've had other couple of, you know, I, I did a few seasons um, working with Mauricio Rubenstein, you know, there are other people that I worked seasons with that I would like to would have liked to consider work, continue working for, but the projects we were on got canceled. They didn't get other work, you know, and just so happens, you know. Yeah, actually, I, I had the opportunity to work with Mauricio a bit on Power and Ray Donovan, uh, yeah. uh, and I'm going to speak with him next week as well. Good. Well, send my love to him too. Of he's, course. He's, he's a dear friend of mine as well. Yeah, I have to say that's that's again, one of the impetuses to make this series, but also the reason to just keep connecting with people. You meet some people on a job and it's just so exciting when you meet these uh, creative individuals that maybe you wouldn't have met otherwise and you just like wanna work with them again, but you know, we'll yeah. see when that happens. Yeah, this, I say there's, a, you know, like I said, I mean, Mauricio and I talk, you know, he keeps getting hired on shows as the additional, on shows that already have a DIT, otherwise he would absolutely ask, you know, for me. He and I are close. Like, I mean, if he got a new show, I think that, you know, I would certainly get a call for that. You know, Teo Maniachi is another person who, you know, I've worked with. If Gabe's not available, I'm certainly, you know, his first call, you know, Frank's. Um, but, you know, like I said, there's a lot of people, a lot of good DPs out there, you know. So, as you know, look, I, I, I think that this industry, you know, it's rife with a lot of interesting personalities. You know, it's not like, you know, you're not really generally working with boring people. You're working with eccentric people on a lot of different levels, you know, and it really is, you know, a personality game. I mean, you know, you just need to know how to get along with people, you know, and it's, it's you know, I think it's important, you know, I, you know, I, I go back to, you know, it's like the things you learned in kindergarten are the things that work, you know, be, you know, treat others the way you want them to treat you, you know, be nice to people, they'll be nice to you. You know, I tell all the time, you know, you catch more bees with honey than you do with vinegar. You know, that doesn't mean I don't get pissy at times. You've seen me get pissy once or twice, I'm sure, you know, but for the most part, you know, just try and, you know, have a good time, you know, that's what it's about. Well, I guess we, we have to kind of talk about the elephant in the room, but what do you think our industry is going to look like post COVID? It's, it's so hard to tell, you yeah. know, I mean, look, we have no idea what this virus really is, what's going to happen. Look, this could be like SARS and it, it, it could go away, you know, not the way Donald Trump said it would, but you know, yeah. but it could, you know, it's possible it could go away you know, that all of a sudden it's just not there, possible. Um, I think that this, the, the strategies that they're looking at now to try and keep social distancing on a film set are a touch unrealistic. Um, I know for me personally, because, you know, I spoke to some people who said, I don't know if I'm comfortable going back to work. Well, I'm comfortable going back to work because I know just like I have my whole career I will not stay in an unsafe position. You know, we've been in unsafe situations in our careers many times. You know, I'm like that with smoke. You know, if they're doing smoke on set, I refuse to be in the room. You know, I'm not going to do that to myself anymore. You know, I, I'm, you know, I have, I'm very sensitive to it. So for me, you know, for me, protocols would be, okay, 
no more anyone in my tent. My second monitor that's usually on my cart, I'll put outside of my tent on a stand you know, or another cart so that the DP, and if he wants to be near other people, he can. I'm not going to be in a tent with another person right now. You know, I'm just not going to do it. Um, I'm going to use a mask when I'm out around people. Anything that's handed to me, I'm going to, you know, then sanitize my hands before I touch my face. You know, if, if you if you do proper hygiene, you can keep yourself safe. I mean, look, I know for years, you know, our sets were like petri dishes. You know, I mean, when the flu came around, so I have sets, entire sets, you know, sick. And yeah. one of the biggest problems is, and this is something that, you know, I see that's in there, but I don't know how they're going to implement it. If we don't have proper sick leave, it's really, really hard. I mean, come on. How many times have you gone to work sick? You, yeah. know? <laughs> you know? I mean, even, how many times have you gone to work with a fever? You know, I mean, like sick, sick, sick. You know, I mean, I've gone in, I'm pretty lucky. I don't get sick that often. Um, but, you know, I'm in a position that if I don't show up, what's going to happen? You know, there are some jobs nobody even knows how to turn my card on. So, you know, I've gone into work where I'm definitely not, you know, healthy and, you know, and should have taken the day off. But you yeah. don't because you take the day off, you don't get paid. You, don't, you know, it's all the, everybody thinks they're irreplaceable. They're concerned if they take a day off that they're not going to get hired again. Yeah. You know, those, those things need to change if we hope to build a safer workplace. You know, the hours thing, the amount of hours we work, absolutely your health is based on how much rest you get, you know, and, you know, the lack of proper turnaround, you know, those kind of things, that still has to be addressed. You know, I know that for years we've had talk about long hours. I'm not the greatest person to talk about that because I'm a type A kind of person. I like to work. I, I really like the fact that I can work seven months a year and make the kind of money I make and take five months off. That's why I chose this work, you know, so I could do that. You know, I'm, I'm into, you know, working and then taking large blocks off. But, you know, on a nine, if you're doing a nine month TV show and you're doing Fridays every week and, yeah. you know, you're living on six hours sleep every day, if that, and no weekend, that's just not healthy. You know, it's just not a healthy thing. Um, so, you know, hopefully there'll be an awareness. Hopefully this will be that opportunity to have an awareness to that and an understanding that it doesn't need to be that way. You know, I think that there's going to be a huge mandate. Um, hang on one second. Can we pause? Okay, we had a pause. We are resumed. Okay. So I, I, I was saying, you know, that hopefully this will be an opportunity for the industry to take a look at the kind of hours and working conditions we work under and recognize that we don't need to do that. And I think that there's going to be mandates finally, especially in TV, to put the writers under some control. Because the problem with television is the writers are the producers. They don't care. You know, they'll, you know, write whatever they want to write. They don't want to compromise. You know, it's ridiculous. I work on TV shows. They're network shows. They can only be 44 minutes and they come with 57 page scripts. So that means we're shooting almost two days of material that can't possibly be on air. Why? Mandate that it's a 44 page script. You know, don't, you know, don't let them be lazy. And, but I think you're going to see that, you know, there's going to be a change in writing style. And, and a lot of it is going to come from, you know, most, especially like TV shows, you know, they're topical. Well, okay, this is the world that we're living in now. People wearing masks, people staying six feet apart, no more shaking hands. You know, so I think you're going to see that, you know, you're going to see that, that, that kind of imagery in, you know, in the writing that, that we're going to get, you know, when we go back. As far as the crews, it's hard for me not to be cynical and not think that the producers are going to try and use this as an opportunity to limit crew size and have people doing multiple jobs and things. Um, I hope that's not the case, and I hope that the union steps up to, to fight that. I mean, I'm all for, you know, you want to do smaller jobs? Let's make everything single camera, you know, one camera crew. We can do that. You know, let's shoot single camera. You know, it's the best way to shoot anyway. 
you know, it looks the best, you know, and then we can have, you know, multiple, you know, we want to, if you need to have multiple crews, you know, have one director shooting one thing, you know, I mean, there's ways of doing things, but I, I fear that the producers are going to try and use this as a money saving thing, um, you know, and use the, you know, the, the amount of people on set as a way to cut back on, you know, crew members, but we'll see. Um, the DIT position, I have some concerns because obviously it's not a mandated position. Half the TV shows don't have one to begin with. Um, so I think that if you're looking at crew size, well, that's a position that they see as expendable. Now, on the other hand, if you're going to be looking at safety and want to be able to have additional video villages, you want to have remote monitoring, all these different things, that's all technology that DITs are very well suited to provide. You know, so hopefully that's what will happen. You know, hopefully that, you know, we'll be streaming to the writer's room and they won't be on set, you know, to the producers, to the editors, to everything. We'll be streaming this stuff out and we'll come up with, you know, technologies that which already exist and just there's some, some, some technical problems that have to be overcome, you sure. know, as far as, you know, where sure. you can get a signal, you know, strong enough bandwidth to send those kind of things. So I think that there's possibly an opportunity for DITs, but there's also, you know, there's also, you know, a, you know that possibly strategically they could be a position that would be eliminated, but yeah. they've been saying yeah. they're going to eliminate the DIT since it started. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, you know, like I said, that's where, you know, I think that, you know, people are itching to get back to work. Um, regretfully, there are many, because of their financial situation, who are going to go back to work regardless of, of the safety standards. Yeah. Um, and that's sad. Um, you know, and, but that happens, you know, throughout, you know, you have people who go on work on jobs where, you know, safety standards aren't being kept and they stay there because they can't afford not to. Um, that's a sad thing. Uh, but I, you know, I hope eventually we'll get back to some sense of normalcy, yeah. you know, what that's going to be. Like, I, I, I don't see, you know, the protocols that they want to put in place, if that's what's going to be the, I mean, clearly that has to be until there's a vaccine for this, but now there's going to be, you know, a big concern, you know, hopefully, like I said, I mean, look, how many sets have you been on that there's nowhere to freaking wash your hands, you know, that there's not proper bathroom facilities. Well, hopefully yeah. that's going to be mandated now and we're going to be yeah. treated like human beings we should be treated like, yeah. you know, I mean, we're, we're qualified technicians, you know, we shouldn't be treated the way we are on some of these jobs. Yeah. You know, so, but that's kind of what I, you know, see, you know, coming forward, you know, we'll yeah. see how quickly it all comes about and, uh, you know, God willing, you know, people, you know, it won't, you know, it won't cause another, you know, pandemic. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your time so much, Lewis. Um, I feel oh, like these are pleasure. really important things to talk about and especially with the, with so much unknown, the least we can do is at least open dialogues for what we could imagine it to look like or be like, and hopefully certain things will change for a good, for a good reason, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I hope so. Well, we'll see. I say, you know, I've been, you know, I, for me, it's going to be tough because you know, I'm a hugger, you know, <laughs> I, I get, I'm going to hate not being able to hug people. Hello and goodbye. I'm going to hate yeah. that. But I think, I think that that, I think that, I think handshaking, I think a lot of those things, I mean, that's just going to be a societal change that you're going to see, Yeah. you know? Um, and, you know, like I said, hopefully people will recognize, you know, the need for, you know, better hygiene and things. So we'll see. Is yeah. there anything else you'd like to add or to say to any younger people in this industry or people in this industry, no matter where they are? You know, you know, it's funny. Uh, because I've been doing this for 40 years now. I can't believe it, but it's 40 years, maybe almost a little longer now. And uh, for the most part, I've loved this industry. I mean, when I think about the things that I've gotten paid to do, you know, the, the, the things that I've seen, you know, when I, when I used to shoot live events, you know, the concerts that I shot, you know, the, you know, the sporting events that I, I mean, I was on the ice when the Rangers won the Stanley Cup for the first time in 50 years. I mean, the things that I, that this industry has afforded me to be able to do, 
by doing them and also, you know, the good living that I've been able to afford because of, you know, what I get paid to do it. Like I said, for the most part, I really love this industry. I reach a point where I get frustrated with, you know, like for the last, you know, the last quite a few years, you know, the whole, you know, the bean counters who kind of mandate what can and can't be done and it's just not how it should work. And you get frustrated with not being able to do things the way you'd really like to do them the right way. And so it's been tough for me to be encouraging to young people about this because of those things, even though I know how blessed I've been to be in this industry. But I think for someone, this is this is not a job. You know, this is a career and this has to be a passion and a love because I'm sorry, you can't work, you know, a 14, 15, 16 hour day if you don't love this. You just can't do it. You can't make this kind of sacrifices that a lot of people make in time with, you know, lack of time with their family and other things unless you really love this. You know, it's not something that you can just do just for the money. You know, I mean, look, money is important. You know, you can't live without it. This is unless you want to live out and, you know, find a commune that you can participate in, be the videographer for and not have to do other things. But, you know, it can't be the driving force. You know, the, the you know, wanting to be part of this, you know, it's got to be the driving force. Well, I appreciate you so much, Lewis. I know you've, you've yeah. shaped my Can I do career. my, hey, peace out, drop the mic. All right. <laughs> yeah, I'm, not, was- I'm not allowed to say the B word anymore. My daughter told me I can't use the B word on my peace out anymore. You know, that it's not politically correct. <laughs> I said I was never talking about women. I always just considered everyone my bitches. That was it. You know, <laughs> but my daughter told me, nope, you've got to stop. So, okay. I don't. So now That's it's fair. just peace out. In my mind, I'm saying the B word, drop the mic. <laughs> that was great. Stay safe. Stay I'll safe. talk to you later. You too. Okay, bye. Bye.